I was born in Belgium, raised in Luxembourg, uh, and then I studied again in Brussels. You know, Luxembourg is a small country, but it is, you know, there are very, a lot of different nationalities coming together. There's also a way of looking oneself as a nation, which is very interesting. So there is an identity, a Luxembourgish identity, but which is val welcoming to other nations, because also there's a need, economically speaking. And so Luxembourgers are very pragmatic about this and actually welcome people to come. And also Belgium, again, uh, and Brussels specifically, as with the international institutions that are there, it is a welcoming culture where you, as, as a foreigner, feel actually welcome to contribute to the well-being of, of the society, of the local society, yes. story. <laughs> I have to start there with uh, the background of my parents. So both of my parents uh, are from Cameroon and they both came to Paris where they met um, to, uh, to study. Uh, that's where they met. Uh, due to certain circumstances, I ended up in a foster family in Luxembourg. Okay. So that was already like a whole journey. <laughs> so actually I had then my African family but I also had my Luxembourgish family. So I was actually, as, from, as a child, so from infancy onwards, I was actually between two cultures all the time. I mean, this is something that I think many people with mixed cultural background go through, is like finding your own space. Um, because, I mean, to put it very bluntly, uh, for the Africans, you're not African enough, <laughs> but for the Luxembourgers, you don't look like a typical Luxemburger, right? So, uh, which fostered in me, a certain way actually like to looking to be recognized so kind of to perform well to be said that you're part of society actually i was always thinking or feeling that also as a as a person of color that i had to overperform to start at zero <laughs> so first people would see me then there was like okay he's black and now i had to perform to actually have the same opportunities as all the others oh even though i must say that in luxembourg i felt very lucky or blessed that it never was a hindrance. It was an obstacle, but not a hindrance that it blocked me to, to make my way. Um, I decided then, still I was looking for my identity, uh, to go to Cameroon for six months after graduation, high school. And uh, I met my father there. I met also my brothers and sister from father's side. And it was very beautiful because for what for the first time in my life, if I would just dress up like local people, I could just disappear in the mass of people, right? But as soon as I would open my mouth and the accent was here, logically speaking, they would understand that I was not local, that I must, was not from there. And there's like an expression in Cameroon, uh, which is called Bengist, which is used for everybody who actually are Cameroonians that come from outside, but as well Cameroonians that have gone abroad. Logically, this word was used also for me. And what's, I mean, in the beginning it hurt me because I was going there looking for belonging. <laughs> and again, I was the different one. So what I took from that experience in the end was that I realized that while I was in Africa, I tended to defend Europe, but while I was in Europe, I tend to defend Africa. So. I'm in the middle and I will never find my space, but I could also look at it from, I am home everywhere. And so I started to see my role into creating bridges. So in that sense, I realized that what I had was not a lack of identity, but I was rich in identity and I could share this with many people because I could actually knock on different cultures and each time create understanding. And that's kind of how I just started to define myself uh, as of that moment, let's put it that way. Of education. So I think what brought me to education was I was inspired by a former teacher um, that we were, I think I was in third grade, so I was nine. And he took the time or maybe it was his natural way of being, to ask very deep philosophical questions during class, where we were doing math or French or whatever. He had this way of, at each time, asking fundamental societal questions to nine-year-olds. And I was fascinated by that. 
like um, and I think on the other hand I think I always um, tended also as a child to help others so I was I was kind of gifted so that I was part of the better students let's put it that way but apparently what I was told also is that I had the tendency to always help others and I think from there I derived this longing to, to become a teacher um, and yeah so I, that's how I started this journey into into education uh, which questioned actually my love for education a lot because um, I mean you see your education on one side and also when I went to Cameroon so I was actually doing a year of service there uh, I felt confirmed in that way, but then when I started my training, I saw to the pressure that is there as, a, as an actor in this uh, in this field, right? Especially as a teacher, because I was trained as a primary school teacher, and um, so there's pressure from the parents, right? There's pressure um, from your peers, so your colleagues, when you move, when you give your class on to the next one, and then I mean there's backbiting happening, uh, like hey why is this class why this competence is not there i lost time because you know all of these these things that happen um and then there's also the pressure that you make yourself because you want to do your job good right and in the end i came to the conclusion that the biggest issue that we have in education and i think it continued also in that continues afterwards also in high school and in university etc is this question of that we want to be able to assess the abilities of somebody. So if something comes in the curriculum, the question is first asked, is it accessible? <laughs> Can we make an assessment on it? So it's not, do we look at really the capacities that we want to develop? We will look first, can we quantify it? And based on that, it enters or not. So it's more about creating numbers or scales than actually looking at the development of the human being. And that is something that profoundly hurt me because also my way of teaching was always that I created conditions first for the children to want to learn and that created tensions <laughs> because first of all my goal was that they like to come to school but that was not seen as enough <laughs> so I mean there's always a balance that has to be found in it but I feel that the fundamental issue to come back to it is like this that we are so focused around it because in the end if I say there's there's like tension is like because the parents want their children to you know have a good assessment <laughs> and even I myself in the end with all love that I have for them uh, and I created these beautiful conditions at the end I have to ask myself do they pass the test so I think if you would go away from that and just really put the development and the learning process in the center of it instead. And I don't know yet, I don't have to answer what it would look like. Um, I think we would have a way more beautiful educational system. I, I, I see more similarities than differences. And I'm um, sorry that I hope that leaders don't think that I treat them now as primary school uh, pupils. But I think in the end, what all humans from a very young age till at the end of our life, what you're looking for is meaning. A child always wants to know why. And I think as parents, I mean, we know that this can be very annoying, <laughs> but the same way I was very surprised that even if I go do my leadership trainings, be in front of CEOs, uh, top management, middle management, in the end, when they are there, they ask like, why? <laughs> so fundamentally, the difference is not so big. Um, now, for sure, there is a different of logic, a different like approach. You know, you can talk to an adult differently than you can talk to a child. But in the end, we are looking for the same thing. And it's again about creation, the conditions, and also the way we work with Soul.com is about creating the conditions for individuals to thrive, to look, I mean, in the first step, also the introspection, <laughs> who am I, what, um, because soul-driven leadership, I mean, in the end, I mean, this is one of our courses, is about, hey, I want to identify a need, and how can I answer to it with my abilities, right? And as with, with uh, uh, primary school, with my uh, students, it was the same because at the end, it's, I mean, here's a question. <laughs> Look inside of it, you have all the knowledge, 
and try to find the answer to it. So again, it's, I think for me, it's not so different fundamentally speaking. It's just the approach and the questions that we ask are different ones. So I think a lot of my assumptions, uh, my prejudice has been uh, put in question <laughs> while I was there. So um, I mean, so I went to the AISA, so it's called, it's French actually, it's like Association Internationale de Jeunes Avocats, so from young lawyers till 45 years. I was invited there to give actually sessions on um, uh, gender equality, so diversity gender questions, and uh, to explore it in a maybe different way than uh, what they expected. And um, yeah, so I think, again, my first impression was, okay, lawyers, I think all the ideas that we have in our mind is like cold sharks looking for how they find the uh, weakness in you to exploit it against you. I think this is like, you know, what media kind of tells us about lawyers. And, you know, I, they taught me differently. Like, I, I, I mean, as I, as I told also many people there, I was so surprised about how human, you know, even compared to other business or even other like uh, networks at all for social work, right? They were, because like I could sit or stand in a corner for maybe 30 seconds and then all, all of a sudden somebody would come around and ask me who I am, thinking that I was a lawyer, but that didn't matter, asking and then like really trying to connect. Um, I was I was even uh, jokingly say, hey, this is not a B two B network; it's an H to H, like human to human, <laughs> because people really tried to connect and put the relational before the transactional. I think it is possible to find a human network, and I think some people or some companies actually or institutions etc. they found it, um, but it, I think it was a very, let's put it, they didn't know how, to, how they went to it. So it was like they tried different things, and it was maybe not something conscious, but it was just the result of doing the right things, right? If, sometimes I compare it with a relationship, right? You can, you can just find the right person, you are not really consciously working on your relationship, and it still works. <laughs> Some on the other relations you have to do it consciously, right? And it's also beautiful if you do it consciously because then you can share actually your insights. Um, so I think something that is very important to find the human inside of um, inside of the workspace is showing vulnerability. I think that is something that I learned actually just very recently that many times when we have these tensions, when we have this images that we try to keep up, which actually in the end, if you ask everybody is creating, um, has like negative repercussions. If we just show our vulnerability, it opens up because many, it's very, in very few instances, I saw that somebody showed vulnerability and the other one, it was like <laughs> hitting on top of it, but actually it, it allows the other one to question himself, right? So if I would come to you and say, hey, the way you were speaking to me the other day, it created, I was insecure about it. I, I doubt that somebody would like hit on top of it, right? And it just creates a moment of where the other one can also actually relate to you and again, open up. And then we create like this human moments <laughs> where we are not just the role that we fulfill. So I think vulnerability is a, is a, is a big, is a big uh, element to play in. Because I'm not such a scared person. That's a that's a that's a difficult question. Uh, what are the things that are scaring me? What is scaring me? Uh, and I think that's more around. That doesn't have so much to do with my work, uh, to be honest. It, it's more what I see when I look the current um, polarization of society. What I mean by that is like uh, taking, for example, like the whole question of vaccinations that, that is there at the moment, and realizing that when I talk to people that we are not able anymore to talk with one another if we're on the different parts of the argumentation of the discourse because we don't recognize anymore each other's sources of knowledge. What do I mean by that? When I talk about vaccination for example and I say hey there are this number of studies telling 
telling us uh, these results, they question fundamentally the, the source that I'm telling them, uh, that, I'm, that I'm referring to. So, and on the other hand, they then refer maybe to other studies or to YouTube videos, etc., where I say, hey, is this really a reliable source? So the problem is that as we have no more, before I believe, let's put it this way, before I believe we had the same sources, but they were interpreted in different ways. So we still had a common ground to talk about. But now we have like two different worlds that are self, like where there's like, like self-confirming bias happening within them. And so there's no more ground of talking. And this for me personally scares me because I believe personally that this is like, and I don't want to sound too um, extreme, but this is for me like what happens before civil war, when two, ground, two fractions cannot talk anymore with one another. So I believe that we have to, and it's based always on a question of, if you question each other's source of knowledge, I think in both cases there are legit reasons why. There were interests that were, or there was trust that has been misused. So we have to see how can we again build trust in these sources of knowledge? What can institutions do to, to regain the trust of the population so that we can actually talk again with one another and in that way find together solutions? Now, what gives me hope um, on the other side um, is that I see uh, a lot of awareness that is raising. So referring back, for example, to this lawyer uh, associations that, uh, that I was in and we had these sessions of gender equality and, and I see men <laughs> seeing the, su the suffering of women and understanding it and seeing the willingness for change, right? But on the other hand, women are not polarizing what i saw in these few eight sessions that i did that this that actually we recognize each other's suffering so again i think this is a question of vulnerability coming again created understanding and this willingness to collaborate to change and that is something that i actually observe more and more that we are willing to it's not anymore like this who is suffering more <laughs> but it's like recognizing each other's suffering and then creating understanding and moving on. And I think I see this in many instances, and that gives me hope actually that we will overcome the, the difficulties that we see as face as humanity right now. How am I building the future? Oh, good question. I think there it's it's on different levels. So what I like to do is actually just talk with people. <laughs> I mean, uh, very basic. Uh, so being, I mean, being a human and uh, I'm doing a lot of car sharing when I go bef uh, between Brussels and Luxembourg and each time taking the opportunity to have like a very beautiful conversation with people which have very different mindsets because you don't know who you're actually sharing your car with in the end. And I just believe that, you know, a lot has to do with meaningful conversations. How can we have this conversation that inspires each other? I think many of us had this conversation, very short, even sometimes at a bus stop, where somebody gave you an insight that changed your life fundamentally. And I believe by just talking to one another, you don't know what you're saying and you don't know what you leave with, with that person, but it can fundamentally change, but we have to be open to it and generously share and listen so that we can determine it. On a professional level, yes, I, I also believe a lot that impact is important. So I feel very lucky that I can collaborate with Soul.com to work with leaders, uh, future leaders, uh, current leaders, to really think about, hey, who do we want to be as a company? Who do we want to be as, a, as an institution? And to really think about what is our impact that we have? So in that sense that I also can professionally help others <laughs> to, to make their work meaningful because I believe that we have to spend so much time at work, uh, eight hours plus for many of us. And I think it's important that we feel that we have a positive impact there, right? So I hope that I can help some people <laughs> with uh, finding meaning in their work. Um, and then also personally, I like to take time to find actually also a lot of people that are a little bit younger than me and uh, mentor them. I mean, many times I'm asking myself who I like to mentor people, but for some reason, some of them are drawn to me. And in the beginning, I didn't feel up to that task, but now actually I'm taking that 
responsibility actually and um, helping them uh, like finding answers to their questions so actually what I was doing all the time as a teacher uh, but just very specifically so to that question and also building like deep friendships because it's, for me it's not about mentorship it's building friendships and because I'm learning also a lot from them in the end so yeah so that's I think kind of the three levels on which I try how I help to build the future yeah It's, it's beautiful. I mean, just, I mean, let's look just at the surroundings, right? Just like the mountains, um, the hotel itself, the place, it's like already inspiring, right? It's really this moment of, also, it's, it's actually, it's, um, it's very metaphorical, this idea of being here and having this overview. So actually what we're doing right now here is like stepping out for a moment and get reading reality together, right? And then we have this overview and based on that, you know, you can then make a plan of how do we act? Why, where do we want to have impact? Understanding where our circles of influence are, I'm actually looking forward to that. And understand like where can we have the impact and what, what are the trigger points that we can push, right? So this, and on the other hand, it's like the people that are here. Um, it's been a while since I could really have the freedom to really dive deep into my reflections, but also to be able immediately to share it with others to have to get feedback on it, to, to see my assumptions challenged and to feel growing <laughs> every minute uh, with others together. So this really collective thriving that is happening here. And this is a really beautiful feeling and I think that's what makes us actually human at the end. Um, now, the most important at the end, I believe, is that we act. So I hope that by the end, we all feel energized when we go back out of this impact retreat that, to act to have impact. The future is, for me, a more humane world where, I mean, let's close the circle, where we are not focusing on accessibility but where we look at how do we want to grow as humans. It's a world in which we are looking for the progress of each individual for a common good. I think it's a world in which actually the material well-being is just a manifestation of the coherence that we have as individuals, but also as a group. I think that's the, the future that we are trying to build and that will also come. I'm quite confident, especially being in a place like this.